Okay, so our next speaker, um, we're going to start again now. Um, our next speaker is, uh, as the title slide says, Dr. Owen O'Dell of the School of Law in Trinity, and he was also chair of the Copyright Review Committee. Um, if anybody didn't register on the way in, um, I'm going to send around a sheet, if you, if you wouldn't mind just um, including your, your name and email address, please. Okay, thank you very much, Darius, for that introduction and for the invitation to come and speak today. I'm thrilled and delighted to be here. This is the uh, Copyright Review Committee, which was established on the 11th of May 2011, and there's a very strong cork element in it. Working from the right is Professor Steve Headley, who's a professor of law here in UCC, uh, and then um, a suit that I have grown out of, unfortunately. <laughs> um, nearly grown out of it then, but have grown out of it since. Uh, I'm a UCC grad uh, and had more lectures than I care to remember in this very building, though not in this very room, because uh, it didn't exist then. Uh, and then the uh, Minister for um, Intellectual Property in the Department of uh, Enterprise, Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation uh, represents a Cork constituency. And finally, on the left is uh, Patricia McGovern. She's in practice in Dublin and uh, is a Trinity grad, so she wasn't a Cork person. Now, the committee was Patricia, Steve, and myself, um, and we presented our consultation paper and our report to the minister, of whom more anon. Now, as I said, we were established three years ago this week. So, um, you know, it's, it's happy birthday and so on, but given that happy birthday is still within copyright, uh, I am not going to sing it. Also, probably better for your ears that I don't sing it. Now, our terms of reference. We had quite extensive and quite detailed terms of reference. Thankfully, not those. Uh, we were to examine the copyright legislation that we've been discussing today and to look to see the extent to which that legislation created barriers to innovation and to the extent that it did to recommend solutions. We took a very broad view of what constitutes innovation because government policy is taking a broad view of what constitutes innovation. We're not just talking about um, uh, electronic devices. Uh, we go the, the, the whole gamut to include social, cultural, educational, and so on. We were also uh, asked to look at a topic that um, Louise mentioned briefly, fair use, and I will come back to explain what was meant by that, and if necessary, to make European recommendations. Uh, one of the things we added to that to ensure that barriers to innovation were reduced or removed was to make the legislation as tech neutral as possible, to make it as digital compliant as possible. So although my title is um, Copyright Reform for Teaching and Learning, and today is all about digital teaching and learning. Uh, the, uh, so far as the Copyright Review Committee work was concerned, it's all of a piece. Now, um, I can describe the work of the Copyright Review Committee in terms of a trilogy, hence the pretty picture of three books. And you will notice that there is on every slide um, a, a uh, line on the bottom showing where I got the slide. Uh, and if you go, if you click through that, um, you'll see that uh, they're all um, uh, um, Creative Commons licensed or public domain or equivalent. So we held, after we were established in May, we held a first public meeting in July and we sought a first round of submissions. We got several hundred submissions um, which we worked our way through and we published a uh, consultation paper on the 29th of February. Uh, I, I notice now that it was the 29th, I don't think we realised it at the time, it just happened to be the Tuesday or something. Um, and that is the, uh, um, the, the cover of the consultation paper uh, and as you can see we took a wordle and you can see that uh, copyright work, innovation and submissions were the most, re the most uh, regularly cited words in the, in the paper. Uh, the second uh, stage in the trilogy, uh, we held a second public meeting. In our consultation paper, we asked 86 questions. I really wanted 95. I wanted it to be, you know, 95 theses pinned to the door of Dal Aaron or something. Um, uh, but no, we only got 86. We asked 86 questions. We, we held a second public meeting, a second round of submissions. Um, we specifically wanted to reach out beyond the usual suspects, the people who will see the departmental um, circulars, uh, who have the, the law firms or the um, 
uh, the, the lobbyists to be able to engage and to reach a much, bro a much broader audience, which I will describe in a moment. And we did that by means of various online questionnaires, as well as our public meetings. And we published our report on the uh, 1st of uh, October last year. Uh, and this is the, the cover of our report. For those of you who suffer from insomnia, I heartily recommend it. Um, this uh, image on the cover, I have permission from the Royal Irish Academy to use. It's their digital image of the Caja St. Columba, which featured in the first copyright dispute. It, Ireland invented copyright because Columba and Finian um, brought a copyright <coughs> dispute to um, King Dermot in 561. And King Dermot said, uh, this is the reliquary or the cover, um, uh, which is reputed to have covered the, um, uh, the um, uh, Caja of St. Columba. Um, and King Dermot said, uh, to every cow it's calf, to every book it's copy. The implication being that um, uh, if you have the original, you're entitled to the copies as well. And this is a 10th century, uh, 10th century summary of the life of Dermot, which records that judgment, and that's the back cover of the Copyright Review Committee report. But that's, those are the only pretty pictures in the report. Um, uh, for the rest, it's just boring text and statutory provisions. We proposed um, a very specific series of recommendations, which I will talk through now, um, and distributed um, on the seats is a summary of the sections in the bill, uh, with some text that, uh, that I will be referring to as we go along. So we proposed a very, a very uh, precise series of exceptions in the hope that by having a bill that was ready to go, the government would um, be incentivized to innovate and actually reform copyright along the lines that we suggested. Um, we had a third public meeting where the government said, thanks very much, we're going to think about this, we're going to listen. And they're still thinking and they're still listening. What's going to happen next? New act, question mark, this year, two question marks. Uh, let's wait and see. So, when we think about copyright, it's very easy to think about copyright from the perspective of the copyright owner, the uh, author or creator of the copyright work. Um, and uh, Louise earlier referred to the Irish Copyright Licensing Association. That's their, um, that's their logo. It's the cow from To Every Cow It's Calf, To Every Book It's Copy. It's a cow, but it's a cow with horns, uh, which is a bit bizarre when you think about it. Uh, and then with the little copyright logo in the middle of the horns. Um, so uh, these are basically the dominant voices in a lot of copyright discussion about why copyright matters. Copyright matters because it's a property right that's generated and therefore owned by the uh, copyright creator, the rights holder, and it's then monetized by being licensed ooh, sorry, to us because we either buy the book or we pay for the right to copy it or whatever. And these are the strongest voices. But there's a lot of real estate on this slide, so it won't, be, it won't come to, as a surprise to you to know that we identified lots of other members of the copyright community as well, whose interests also had to be balanced in considering um, copyright uh, rights, interests, and reform. One is uh, intermediaries. You know, they, they provide the tubes. If the internet is a series of tubes, they provide the tubes through which the data sloshes. The poor put upon um, uh, user uh, of copyright, whether it is the person who buys the DVD, whether it is the, uh, those of us who want to use some material in class, whether we just want to format shift from our computer to our iPod or whatever. Um, and, you know, I often feel a bit like the, the munch scream guy uh, when I'm trying to navigate copyright. And we saw that this uh, earlier this afternoon when we went through uh, Mary's questions. Uh, then there are the entrepreneurs, the people who invest money to make money, uh, and the, the innovators, if you like, for whom the government uh, posed the questions to us about the reform. And finally, the, um, uh, the heritage uh, community, libraries, archives, galleries, uh, educational institutions, museums, and so on. Um, and each of these have different interests. And our job, we thought, was to try and come up with a set of balanced proposals that would take all of these interests into account uh, and make life as easy as possible as between them. Our first suggestion in this respect was that there ought to be a copyright council. 
um, that uh, if it was a, a widely based, widely representative organisation representing all of the interests in the copyright community, uh, it would be a context in which a lot of these issues that we've been discussing today could be discussed and thrashed out and solutions acceptable across the board, or at least broadly acceptable across the board, could, could emerge. So our view was that it should be created by the copyright community, it should be an independent body, uh, it should have as widely representative a board as possible, um, and then once it is set up, it could be recognised by the Minister and given some statutory underpinning in the Bill so that it could, could get on with its work. And it would have a whole range of functions, three of which I think are very important for today. The first is that it could provide an alternative dis uh, dispute resolution service, which would mean that you wouldn't end up in the High Court because far too many, even trivial, copyright matters end up in the High Court, and it's not a pretty place to be. It's like um, surgery without an anaesthetic, and that's just for the lawyers. I can't imagine what it's like for the clients. It would provide a solution for orphan works, which libraries are bumping their heads against regularly. And it would have an education, advice, and advocacy role, um, so that it could fill in the blanks, create um, statements of best practice, uh, help in various contexts like uh, um, say for example the IPO in the UK provides guides that are uh, reasonably authoritative interpretation of the legislation or um, some of the functions that, that JISC um, uh, offers uh, it could um, copy. <laughs> <clears throat> right so um, one of the things that makes me wonder about the commitment of the government to the implementation of our report is that we had, as I've just shown you, some quite extensive proposals relating to orphan works. And those proposals reflected, but went much further than, a current European public consultation relating to a directive. Uh, but the department has pressed ahead with a public consultation relating to the implementation of the directive relating to orphan works in print works without reference to uh, the proposals that we made, which I think is unfortunate because it suggests to me that they're not serious about at least this aspect of the, um, uh, of the, of the report. Uh, this is currently, um, uh, in theory, uh, the date for submissions has passed, but in <coughs> fact it's ongoing. And if you really want to tell the department that they should implement the report, please, by all means, do so. Um, okay, you can take that off the, 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 the video stream. Um, okay, so let's, let's look at, from an education perspective perhaps, but also from the perspective of the six various categories of members of the copyright community, some of the education issues that we addressed in the report, uh, in which there might be some reform that would have, I hope, a positive impact on your practice. So first, the um, copyright owners and the licensing agencies, and I chose an image of the copyright creator here, uh, but the reality is that it's not necessarily the author, it's the, it's the publisher, it's the printer, uh, which is significant. Uh, and so um, a lot of our recommendations distinguish between publishing companies, for example, authors and um, uh, copyright licensing agencies, but for our purposes today we can take them as one and the same, um, and let's call them rights owners. Uh, we did not recommend that rights owners should be able to assert levies on um, uh, the means of copying, like you know this little um, um, data data key or computer disks or whatever. This is a very common um, matter on the continent, but we recommended against it on the grounds that it would constitute a private tax on innovation. Um, and as Jason pointed out to me this afternoon, uh, the publishers of the, the creators of these discs already know this and they probably build in that charge anyway. Um, we removed some silly drafting in the, exist the 2000 Act. Um, Louise waved it around. Uh, it was at the time the longest piece of legislation ever introduced into the Irish Parliament. We've had a couple of, copy of company pieces of legislation since that are longer, um, uh, mostly to do with the financial crisis. Um, but. Uh, because it was so long, because it was a hodgepodge from various uh, prior pieces of legislation, European directives and bad ideas all mixed together, there was some bad drafting and we tried to tidy up uh, at least one piece of bad drafting which would have created a perpetual copyright in unpublished works. Um, and we recommended the extension of the range of civil um, remedies, uh, including 
more heads of damages in line with the Law Reform Commission proposal and um, the rights of rights owners to be able to uh, enforce uh, technological uh, uh, protection measures. Why is this important to you? Well, if you create something that's copyright protected, and if it is something that the university returns the copyright to you in, then if somebody infringes it, you're damn well going to want to be able to assert your rights, uh, whether in terms of in the court getting your damages or technologically as against a downstream infringer. We made specific recommendations in respect to photographers. Um, uh, perhaps the, the single biggest set of complaints that we got was from photographers. Uh, because it is just so easy to copy a digital image without, uh, without giving credit. Uh, and we tried to accommodate photographers' concerns as much as we could in terms of allowing the metadata relating to or attached to a, a work, and in particular an image, also to get copyright protection and the stripping of the metadata to be um, an infringing adaptation, which, is, um, which will go some way towards providing an additional range of remedies uh, in respect of copying or unlawful copying of digital images. Sorry, wrong way. Uh, intermediaries. There was a question earlier on today about the copyright status of links. And um, the internet is effectively, whatever about the metaphor of tubes, the internet is effectively constructed upon links. And the Newspaper Licensing Agency took the view that the provision of a link effectively copied the material available at the other end of the link and that therefore that amounted to a, an infringement of copyright. Uh, and it asserted this, um, uh, in this case uh, that I've just uh, highlighted uh, against the charity Women's Aid, um, and uh, required the payment of a license fee on a scale relating to the number of links and the number of clicks. Um, I see a lot of people shaking their heads in disbelief, uh, followed by crumpling of faces, followed by shock. Um, well. Um, the, uh, we recommended that um, linking should not amount to an infringement of copyright. It simply tells you where something is, but it doesn't copy what, what's at the other end, um, unless the linker knew or ought to have known that you were in fact linking to an infringing copy. So if you provide a link to Pirate Bay, uh, so that uh, somebody could stream the most recent episode of Game of Thrones. Well, that link uh, could be an infringement, but if what you're doing is providing a link to the Irish Times, uh, then it wouldn't be an infringement. <coughs> Gratifyingly, other people have said something very similar. Uh, an English case uh, around the time that we were uh, publishing our just after we published the consultation paper and while we were working on the report, said that a link is not enough to constitute communication to the public and therefore wasn't uh, a copyright infringement. And the European Court of Justice said something similar in a case called Svens. So we had, um, I think we were, we were ahead of the curve here uh, in being as clear as we could that linking does not copy, it does not constitute an infringement. And then we were prepared to go further. There's a lot of stuff happening. Google News, for example, um, the, the sort of the annotation or curation or the, the marshalling, the bringing together of information around links. Um, we stole some, uh, some German language that the reproduction of a very small snippet of text reasonably adjacent to the text or to the link and to giving, a f giving content or context to the link should not also infringe copyright. So um, putting the link up and saying at the other end of this link is the Irish Times article on the Guerin report. Um, even if that is the, the headline, shouldn't necessarily infringe copyright. Um, provided it is uh, less than, and we provided a definition, an indicative definition of very small snippet of text. Uh, it depends on the circumstances, but if the circumstances don't generate their own understanding of a small snippet, well then the statutory definition would apply. It's kind of a a default, less than 160 characters or 2.5% of the work, subject to a cap of 40 words. Um, I understand the newspapers don't like this, um, but uh, um, we shall have to wait to see whether this addition, this marshalling addition to, to the linking exception, gets adopted. Okay, users, most people in this room. Um, and we, we recommended a wide range of user exceptions relating to basic user expectations. There are basic things that we expect that we can do 
with material that we have purchased or that we have licensed um, that are currently not necessarily uh, permitted by the exceptions in the statute uh, that we discussed in the first half today. Um, and uh, we recommended that those basic user expectations be reflected in the exceptions in, the, in our bill and therefore in the Act, relating to, for example, user-generated content or parody or private copying or backups, education and disability or uh, consumers. And I'm going to briefly refer to the additional suggestions that we made in respect of education and in respect of disability. Now, as Louise pointed out earlier on, most of the exceptions, not all of them, but most of them are characterised by fair dealing. Uh, that's a fair. There's some horse dealing going on. <laughs> you must laugh at the bad jokes. It's the only way I know you're alive. <laughs> okay, good. That was one. Excellent. So, uh, fair dealing for the purposes of education. Um, uh, and we've already discussed this, purposes of research or private study, uh, course of instruction, or purposes of an examination. Those are the key. So it's not an education exception. It's headed education in the Act, perhaps, and we speak in shorthand about an education exception, but in fact there isn't one. It's research and private study, it's instruction, or it's examination. Um, and I suspect that there are all sorts of things that we can conceive of that are educational purposes, broadly conceived or broadly defined, but aren't narrowly instruction or uh, examination. Um, and uh, so education does not provide a, uh, a sort of a philosopher's stone that allows us to transmute infringement uh, in, into compliance simply by virtue of walking in the front gate of college. So, Mary scanned Olive's diagram. If there's a physicist in the room, uh, he or she will be able to tell me that this is a Feynman uh, diagram for beta negative decay. I have no idea what that means, but I do know that this is basically the only way to draw the diagram. Um, so, uh, the point that um, uh, Darius was making earlier on, that if there is only one way of expressing it, uh, then uh, copyright doesn't necessarily apply. Well, um, in the case of a lot of physics diagrams, uh, if there's only one way of drawing beta decay, if there's only one way of demonstrating the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, well then, copyright won't necessarily apply in the diagram. Now, what does Mary want to do with Olive's diagram? Well, putting it on the poor point, we concluded was probably instruction with perhaps a little bit of a, a doubt around the edges. When you get two lawyers in a room, you get three views. When you get four lawyers in the room, you get a, a whole series of educated shrugs, but you don't get a straight answer. Um, but it's probably, and that's the important word here, instruction. Um, putting it on Moodle and allowing the students to download it, does this constitute private study? In Canada, it would. In the UK, it probably doesn't, but I'll leave it to, to Jason to, to answer this later. Um, in Ireland, it really will depend, and this is one of the places where I have to say it depends on whether we follow the Canadian approach or the uh, UK approach. Uh, one of our recommendations uh, is intended to allow the Canadian approach to apply, but then we'd have to get a, an Irish decision to say so. Um, and then the assessments would be plainly for the purposes of examination. Uh, as I said, in Canada it would. This is because in Canada from 2004, this case, uh, CCH and the Law Society of Upper Canada, it tells two important lessons. The first one is that fair dealing is capable of a relatively wide interpretation if the courts are prepared to do so. Um, uh, we start off with the conception that copyright is all about the, the rights of the creators, the rights of the rights holders, the rights of the um, uh, licensing agencies. But then uh, what has happened since 2004 in Canada is that the rights and interests of the other parties in the copyright community have begun to become uh, recognized as just as central and just as important, and this is the case that started it. That's the first principle, that fair dealing can be made to represent user rights. The second principle is very important, never sue lawyers. Uh, CCH sued the Law Society of Upper Canada Library and lost. Um, you know, I, I just think that that's probably asking for trouble. Um, you know, suing lawyers. They lost. They lost he heavily. Um, it's, it's one of the, the great verities of life. You know, Munster Rugby, Kerry football, and don't sue lawyers. 
Um, now, one of the suggestions we made in respect of education is that we replace things like um, instruction with references to education more broadly defined. And that in the exception relating to, education, to research and private study, that we add education more generally. And we provide a definition of education in the, in the bill and in the materials that have been um, circulated to you. The expansive definition of education uh, is, is provided. So that uh, this, ex this basic expectation amongst the education community that there is an education exception, which is currently not true, uh, we try to meet by providing expressly for educational purposes as the, the key for the exceptions that we're talking about today. So how would that change um, Mary's experience? The 10 minute clip from the movie. Um, section 53, which is the fair dealing exception, doesn't mention films, it's the, the literary works, so section 53 doesn't apply. Uh, does section 55, showing a film for the purposes of instruction, cover it? Probably, but if it doesn't, it would depend on why it was happening in the classroom. Remember, Darius said that uh, if the students were showing it in a film society, it wouldn't be covered. It had to be in the classroom for very specific purposes. Well, we've broadened the range of purposes now, or at least that's what we're recommending. Um, even if that wouldn't work, the additional exception for illustration for the purposes of education may very well work, not just in respect of the film, but in respect of the, um, in respect of the diagram as well. So we're trying to make it easier for normal classroom practice to be able to proceed. Um, and we suggested two additional um, new exceptions. One relates to distance learning. Okay, this is the cow you saw earlier. Uh, cows go moo. One example of distance learning is, yeah, okay, mooks. Uh, hence, distance learning. All right, sorry, okay. You have to laugh at the bad jokes, guys, please. I, 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 go to, I go to enormous lengths to prepare the bad jokes. You could at least acknowledge them. Okay, it's not an infringement of copyright we recommend if an educational establishment um, as defined in the Act, but that would inc include everybody here, uh, communicates a lesson or examination to a student by telecommunication. So the, the remote broadcast, the, the podcast, the video cast. And importantly, the student reproduces it to listen to it or to view it at a more convenient time. The student time shifts or format shifts, or both. Um, at the moment, it's not clear whether the broadcast is copyright free or at least copyright compliant. It's certainly not clear whether the time shift or the format shift at the other end is um, uh, copyright compliant. This would make it clearly copyright compliant. Um, so that uh, um, if I put uh, my lectures up on Moodle, which I do, I record them on my phone, I record them on the, uh, the podcasting software on the computer, depending on the lecture theatre, and I, uh, without even tidying it up, I just chuck it up on Moodle, and about 10% of the students will then listen to it over the course of the following week, and then they'll all listen to it the week before the exam. Um, at least that's what Moodle tells. Well, uh, we don't use Moodle, we use um, Blackboard, which is ugly. Uh, I'm sorry if there's anybody here who's a fan of Blackboard. I much prefer Moodle. Uh, hate Blackboard, but anyway, I throw it up, they use it. Um, now, another, uh, another and very important exception that we're recommending uh, relates to the use of work available on the internet. It will not be an infringement of copyright if an educational establishment reproduces or communicates a work that is available through the internet. Now, this is... I mean, Darius went to a lot of trouble to tell us how to be copyright compliant, and all of my, all of my images are, so far as I know, copyright compliant in the way that Darius described, because I went through the sorts of steps that he explained. But let's assume that uh, somebody purported to put something on Flickr with a, a license, but they didn't have the rights to it in the first place. And then I use that in my class. That person is an infringer. I'm an infringer. I don't want to be. I want to be compliant. Um, uh, is, that, is that something that, that I should be copyright liable for? Well, no. If I found it on the internet and used it on my screen in an educational context, the Canadians have recommended that this not be an infringement of copyright. 
Uh, this seems to us to have been a good idea. We recommend it too, provided that the recommendation that the reproduction or communication is accompanied by a sufficient acknowledgement and a couple of other exceptions relating to the um, normal exploitation of the work and so on. But the key here is to give a sufficient acknowledgement so that it can be traced back. Important, one of the Im modern importances of copyright is um, the proof of ownership, the proof of authorship, as much as the ability to control the material afterwards. Um, briefly, uh, because um, uh, accommodation, reasonable accommodations for disabled students are a very important part of university life. I'm going to speak briefly about uh, copyright uh, exceptions to allow the creation of accessible copies for disabled students. And they are contained in section 104 of the Copyright Act. A designated body, which includes educational institutions, may make a copy um, uh, of a work for the purposes of providing um, an accessible copy to a person who has a physical or mental disability uh, and supply that copy to that person. But that's all. So let's assume um, that I have a student in Trinity who has uh, a print disability and you have a student in your institution who has a print disability doing the same course and we make an accessible copy for our student we can't give it to you for your student, and our student can't give it to your student. It's incredibly narrow. It means you have to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, we recommended the reform of Section 104 to expand the definition of disability, um, to allow the person with a disability to make a copy him or herself that can be an accessible copy. At the moment, the legislation doesn't allow that. Uh, we allow we recommend that uh, designated bodies should be able to share the accessible copies. Um, and we recommend that the minister consider imposing obligations on publishers in the course of their work workflow for the production of the relevant books to keep clean copies, to, keep, to create a clean electronic copy somewhere along the line that can be provided um, for the purposes of the creation of the accessible copy. Uh, this is primarily allowed for in the Marrakesh Treaty, which was adopted on the 27th of June 2013, and our drafts in this respect are entirely Marrakesh compliant. It was going along in parallel, um, and we kept more than a weather eye on it. The important additional thing in Marrakesh that is not easily uh, accomplished in uh, domestic legislation is the ability to uh, for the exchange to happen across borders. At the moment, each Copyright jurisdiction is siloized uh, by virtue of international treaties. There's mutual recognition, but they're independent. Um, the Marrakesh uh, provisions would not only allow the creation of accessible copies, but also allow them to be shared across borders. So if it's an American publication, you can get the um, uh, American uh, accessible copy without infringing the American copyright here. And we included that uh, in our recommendations as well. The European Union signed the Marrakesh Treaty last week. Um, and uh, it's a matter that's currently being discussed between the Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation and the Department of Foreign Affairs. And I rang the departments earlier this week in anticipation of this uh, um, presentation to ask, well, given that the EU has now signed it, are we going to sign it too? And they said they hope to by the end of June. No, they didn't. <laughs> that was going to be my line. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so no, they didn't. They didn't tell us which June. Um, but I hope maybe this June. Uh, but a signature just simply is the is a, is an assertion on the international plane that they want to implement it nationally. But it doesn't say how they will implement it nationally, um, and whether they will use our drafts for that purpose. Entrepreneurs. We were asked to think in terms of innovation um, to allow uh, downstream reproducers of the material to be able to innovate. Um, and we suggested a special innovation exception uh, for works that are substantially different from the original work or substantially transform the original work. Um, as, you know, it's the standard, if I if I'm inspired by something, but then go much further beyond, 
am I still infringing the copyright of the thing by which I am inspired? Well, at the moment in Irish law, probably yes. But something like this might allow you to innovate and develop. Um, this is one of the more controversial suggestions uh, in our report. And uh, the heritage uh, exceptions. Um, uh, libraries probably can format shift for archival or preservation purposes, um, but don't want to because the legislation doesn't expressly say that they can in all of the, in all of the context in which they want to. Uh, so we recommend that they should be able to. We recommend that they should be able to reproduce in their catalogues images in their collection, even if they don't own the copyright in the image. They might own the painting, but not necessarily the copyright in the image in the painting. Um, and that is uh, a significant, has a significant negative impact on catalogues for exhibitions and so on. Uh, we make uh, quite extensive suggestions relating to digital deposit to parallel the uh, paper copyright deposit rules. And in respect of things like today, we added an additional, um, would, and I think very important, uh, educational exception. That the brief and limited display of a reproduction of a work, for educational purposes in an educational establishment or other heritage institution, constitutes fair dealing. It makes it perfectly clear, whatever the debates around question one, Mary and Olive's diagram and so on, that would be, that would, according to this draft section, be clearly fair dealing. Uh, we suggest that the brief and limited display of a reproduction of a work during a public lecture given in an educational establishment or other heritage institution should constitute fair dealing. It shouldn't matter whether I'm talking to you for educational purposes um, as a classroom or talking to you for educational purposes. You're not my students. You're my colleagues and we're having this discussion. And it shouldn't matter whether we have this discussion in this room or because, let's say, the room wasn't available because it was in use for an exam, and we went down the road to the um, very expensive conference suite in the Riverlea Hotel. It shouldn't matter. Uh, in all of those circumstances, the same rule should apply, and that's what we're suggesting in our draft section 69A. And finally, given that this is being um, currently uh, streamed live on the internet and will be made available for download afterwards, um, uh, if you make a copy like that and make it available afterwards, that should also constitute fair dealing. <clears throat> so this is, we think, a very important section that reflects expectations in academic practice and educational practice, um, and I think will be a very important practical uh, reform if it happens. So. Um, Mary scanned Olive's diagram for a PowerPoint slide in a lecture and took a 10-minute clip from a movie for a lecture. If we go through all of the other exceptions and they don't apply, I think sections, our draft 69A2 will make it copyright compliant by virtue of this new fair dealing exception. Finally, I've been talking about fair dealing. All the way through, I've taken the language that Louise set up from the Copyright Act and talked about fair dealing. And she said there is something else. There is this holy grail in American law called fair use, which is something different from fair dealing. And how it is different is this. It starts from a general rule that uh, usages which are fair and do not have an impact on the legitimate rights of the copyright owner uh, should be copyright compliant should be um, exceptions that are approved by law. We don't start with this general rule. We start with a series of exceptions which are currently narrowly interpreted, but which um, in Canada are being more broadly interpreted, and we suggest we should follow the Canadian rules. We were also asked to look at the American experience of fair use, whether we should adopt a US fair, uh, a fair use style, a US style fair use exception. Um, in the uh, CCH and um, uh, Law Society of Opera Canada Library case, that was a case about um, research being done by the library for its users. Um, and that was accepted as fair dealing for the purposes of the Canadian legislation, which is in the same terms as ours. 
One of the discussions that we had earlier on related to the extent to which the uh, Irish, uh, the uh, Copyright uh, Licensing Association license allows course packs. Well, this matter has been litigated under fair use in the US um, in a representative action where the lead plaintiff is Cambridge University Press and the lead defendant is Georgia State University. And the, uh, the court, in, in a judgment that is very similar to, but probably even more significant than the Google Books judgment, which happened around the same time and therefore got all the, the, the press, uh, the, the court said that um, course packs, by and large, as we currently do them, would constitute fair use beyond the confines of the much more limited license that was available um, in Georgia at the time. Did we go down that route? Did we recommend a, a, a US style fair use exception? I'm sorry to say no. And I can actually hear sort of the, 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 the intakes of breath, the, the, the sadness involved. I'm sorry about that. But we did go a very long way towards trying to take some of those principles and make them available as a matter of Irish law. We suggested an alternative Irish style fair use. We said that the existing exceptions should be understood as examples of fair use, which is close to the American approach. Um, we said that they must be considered before getting to this more general exception. Um, and we said that they could form the basis of a development by analogy. One example of the way in which the American approach is more robust than the Irish approach, it was in 1970 that the US Supreme Court said that recording television programs for the purpose of watching them later, what we now call time shifting, was fair use. And an awful lot of other things followed as a consequence, reaching um, Google search, for example, and image search, and so on, um, and format shifting to, you know, take your song from your computer and put it on your iPod. It wasn't until the 2000 Act that we caught up by creating a specific statutory exception for television time shifting. And that's the only shifting exception we have unless and until our recommendations relating to format shifting are implemented. Uh, whereas um, the implementation of the fair use exception allowed this to happen during the course of those 30 years and now 40 years. A um, whole range of American cases developing these exceptions. We've only got one Irish section on the point. Um, the key to fair use is always that it turns on such matters as the, course as the court considers relevant. And we propose that it should look at up to nine factors. Now, not that it has to look at all of them, but that it should look, these are the kinds of things it might want to consider. Um, influenced by fair use understandings, not just in the US, but in other jurisdictions as well, India and Israel, with whom Ireland is often bracketed in terms of foreign direct investment for tech development, um, have gone down this road. And the factors involve developing by analogy with the existing exceptions, um, whether the character of the use is non-consumptive or transformative, so it doesn't actually have an impact on the original, um, whether it is a secondary infringement. Um, you know, I am the, the, the unwitting enabler of another infringement. In many cases, that should not be itself an infringement. Uh, the nature of the work. Some works are such that any copy is, has an impact on it, some works are not. Um, and the amount of the use. If you take too much, you will inevitably uh, be infringing. Mostly, copyright now is not so much about protecting the moral rights of the creator, but the business model of the um, Copyright Licensing Association or the publisher. Um, and exceptions must accommodate to that reality so that the fair use exception um, that we're recommending uh, reflecting some international norms uh, would consider the impact of the use on the normal, normal commercial exploitation of the work. It would consider the, the ability to license sufficient of the rights in the copyright work um, and if you could have licensed it it's unlikely that the use would have been fair um, and again it looks at the general interests of the owner. Um, and finally although acknowledgement doesn't often isn't always necessary, it will be necessary here. The Copyright Council in its 
remit were nearly finished, the Copyright Council, in its remit relating to um, codes of practice, uh, we recommend, if, it's if, it, if the Copyright Council is brought into existence, should be able to provide codes of practice around fair use to clarify it in, in relation to photographs, in relation to educational use, and so on. So, let's see how that might apply in the context of Mary. She took a 10-minute clip from the movie. We've seen that um, there are questions around Section 53. Um, there are potential section questions around Section 55 because it doesn't go very far. It allows in a classroom for a classroom reason, but it doesn't allow any other educational purpose. Um, and if illustration and lectures don't apply, maybe fair use does by analogy with them because it's so close to them. It's sort of, you could probably find the gap where the, they don't overlap, but that, that, in, that gap should be covered by an alternative exception for fair use. So that's the kind of re reasoning that, that we envisage it would apply. The European Union has a consultation open at the moment on copyright generally. The Irish government made a submission to it. It said, and this is very welcome, that they intend to make formal proposals for legislative reform arising from. Now, arising from isn't based on, arising from isn't implementing, but the report at some point in 2014. So we wait and see. What are they likely to do? Well, if we're lucky, we will actually get our new act, but I don't think so. Some of the stuff that we recommended, the uncontroversial stuff, they said to Europe, yes, go ahead and do. But the more interesting stuff, and a lot of the education stuff, they, they, they accepted, thankfully. But the more interesting stuff around innovation, around heritage, around fair use, they didn't mention. Um, there was the opportunity for leadership. A lot of our drafting was to be able to allow the government to take arguments at the European level for the development of copyright, especially around these issues, and they didn't even mention them. I think that's unfortunate. I gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago where I said that effectively the government said nothing of value uh, in the uh, submission. I take it back. They said almost nothing of value in the European submission. They're still listening. They're still thinking. The minister on the left is thinking about copyright reform. The minister on the right, uh, the minister for foreign affairs, is thinking about Marrakesh. But I'm not entirely sure what the thinking and listening is going to result in. Thank you very much.